Column Joy means the author of six novels, The South, The Heather Blazing, The Story of the Night, which is one of my favorites, The Blackwater Lightship, The Master, which everybody loves, and Brooklyn, which everybody loves. He has been shortlisted twice for the Booker Prize and won the Costa Award and the Impact Dublin Prize. That's a lot of money. Twice. <laughs> His latest book is The Empty Family Stories. He lives in Dublin. And here he is. Beatrice. Sometimes sleep is fitful, light, uneven. But in the hour after dawn, it becomes deep and filled with ease, as though the morning itself, appearing in a needle of light in the center of the shutter, carried a message with it. And then she wakes to the sound of Alice, the dog, moving about impatiently. She calls out to her, soothes her before rising from the bed and crossing the room and opening the shutters and letting the golden day into the space. It would be easy now, she knows this, to regret certain things, to let images linger which belong to the night or belong to the past, things which cannot be recovered. She shivers as an image comes to her for a second of a house in Istanbul, large scaled and filled with opulent shadows. <coughs> the house she might have known had things been different. It does not even belong to memory. And yet it has an after image which seems more intense and exact than many places where she's actually lived, as though some part of her wandered or still wanders in a lost place. It is enough to make her think about the rooms downstairs in this house which are echoes of those lost rooms. Conjuring them up now allows them into them a sharper light than the windows do. This house, it strikes her for a moment, was made for happiness. All the work she put into restoring its rooms, planning out its contours. She looks at a photograph of herself and her husband on the table beside the bed, but it is almost as though she does not need to. That is where she looks even when her eyes are closed. Her mind goes there easily, naturally. He is never really absent from her mind. On that table, as always, beside the photographs, there is a pile of books. For a while in the night, she was reading one of them, a first novel, American maybe, recommended by a few people. She shrugs. It was too boring. <laughs> Unlike some of the books below it, all sent by publishers or editors or friends, some of them are good, and she has listed the ones she has read and liked. She trusts her judgment. She's reason to do that. Downstairs on the walls of the rooms hang some of the paintings which she showed in her gallery in Milano. She let herself be guided in those years by taste, by judgment, by instinct. It was not just the work, but the aura around it, or the aura around the painter. And sometimes the two could match, the work pure, perfect, right for its moment, ahead of its time. And the painter too, right for his moment, funny, or cultivated, or wild, or revolutionary, or eccentric, but maybe elegant and charming as well. Those opening nights in that gallery are over now. It would be easy to regret them, but there is no time for that. There are things to do. The rooms downstairs belong to her, to her spirit, as much as her voice does, or her eyes. The style of one of those shadowy rooms could be an echo of a space her mother had known. She smiles now, she thinks of the furniture, the things she has restored, the things she has found in markets, the things she has carried halfway across the world because she thought they would be right for here. There are two writers in the tower, and another two in this house. And they have been gathered with the same care and attention as the painters she showed in her gallery, or the paintings she bought from them, or the furniture in her rooms, or the decor. They have been invited <coughs> for something she saw in them. She read the work carefully. The work came first. 
She's not looking for perfection. Like symmetry, perfection is a sort of <coughs> dullness. She needs things to be eccentric, amusing, but in a way that satisfies her. Her eye for this is unusual. In a market, for example, she will light on something odd, and its oddness will interest her, but that will never be enough. It needs one more thing. In a car going across Mexico, she will see a most unpromising, half-ruined church. The guidebook advises against it. It is of no obvious interest. She will insist on stopping. And in its echoing hall, she will notice one of the stations of the cross. And it will have something. It will hold her attention in a way that something massive and much praised and perfect will not. She wants to see both. But it is the odd thing which makes her feel that the journey has been more than worthwhile. So it is with writers and their books. The work comes first. It must have something. The pile of books with just titles and black marks on the page begin to have a life for her. And if this is the case, she will forgive us much. She will never mind if we are idiots, or talk too much, or are silent, or distracted, or if our attention wanders, or if we get drunk. Or even if we are ugly, she doesn't mind, although she would be happier if we were not ugly. <laughs> but there are some things which cannot be tolerated, for she is Italian after all, and thus she would prefer if we were not scruffy. But she sighs, it is hard to have everything. But shorts on a man in the summer are for the beach and the beach only. And there is nothing worse than a man displaying white Irish legs <laughs> or hairy American legs. It is not elegant. Just as Muslim women in certain countries must cover their faces, so too we in Italy must cover our legs. Even on a hot day, unless we are by the swimming pool, and even then, not for too long. <laughs> and thus, the world of Italy, so glamorous and hidden from strangers, filled with funny rules and exquisite tolerance for some things and deep intolerance for others, is made known in her house like a new grammar or a new set of signs. Time spent at the table listening, talking, watching, is as important as time spent at the desk. Life in her house becomes sort of aspect of a deliberate display of self. One aspect is social. It has many rules. It requires tact and care, instinct and attention. It matters in Italy. And the other is solitary. It's done with tact and care too and instinct and attention. It matters everywhere. She has made rooms for both. And now, as she gathers at each hill and prepares herself for the day, she knows that something will happen soon which will amuse her, satisfy her, and that there are others too here in this house or in the tower. And they may be already working or they may be turning in their sleep. They too will share her feeling of expectation. Some idea that the day is promising, that something will happen, even if it is just the play of light on stone, or a remark made, or the way the colours will deepen as the day goes on. And that will be enough, and it will be the gift she has offered, the gift we will return by not wearing shorts to lunch, <laughs> and by being grateful to her, and by doing our best work in the place she has made for us. Thank you. It's, it's not every day that, uh, that, uh, that one gets the tribute of a great writer, and that's so beautiful, and it's richly deserved by, by you, Beatrice. Um, I, I, have lo I think I've been there three times. I think I was the very first colonist in the colony. And, uh, uh, and, and I, I love going there because 
usually it seems like you never get time to write. I mean, <laughs> in fact, if to write in New York, you have to offend everybody. You, you, you can't go to that lunch. You can't write that article you were expected to do. Um, you, you have to just steal time to do it. But, but at Santa Madalena, it's absolutely wonderful because you wake up, you have breakfast, then you go back, and you have acres of time before lunch to write. And then you have lunch, and then you go back, and you have all this time till a rather late dinner.